Hi, everybody. I'm Josh Welsh, president of Film Independent. Welcome to Film Independent Presents and today's screening of Navalny. Uh, before we get started with the q and I just want to thank our lead funder, the HFPA, and I want to thank Vision Media, our uh, screening partner. Thank you so much for making this year-round program possible. And with that, I am enormously happy to welcome the filmmakers from Navalny, uh, director Daniel Rower and executive producer Maria Pevchek. Daniel and Maria, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Um, it's a pleasure. Such a, a powerful uh, and timely, important film. I'm really excited to talk with you both about it. Um, I mean, just to kick things off, I, I have so many questions about this film. Daniel, to start, I would love to hear how this project came to you or, or, or how you decided to take on this project. It's obviously very different from your last film, Once We're Brothers, the film about Robbie Robertson and the band. Um, what, what is this something you'd been interested? Had you been interested in Navalny for a while, or did this come about sort of fortuitously? Where, how did how did the project start? Well, a little bit of both. Um, and Josh, first and foremost, thank you for having us. It's, it's delightful to be with you with you today and to talk about the film. And thank you all for watching the film. Um, you know, so often making documentary films is is the art of being in the right place at the right time. And I think this film really exemplifies that. I was working on a completely different story with, with Christo Brozev, uh, our Bulgarian nerd at the laptop, who was one of the stars of the Navalny film. And uh, he and myself and uh, Odessa Ray, one of the film's producers, were actually in uh, Ukraine working on a completely different story. Um, and that didn't go very well. And we reached a dead end and I was despondent and trying to figure out what to do next. And that's when Christo walked in and uh, sort of in whispered tones, uh, leaned in and said, I think I might have a lead in the Who Tried to Poison Navalny. And immediately I sort of shot up and said, who's making that movie? And, and Christo was able to reach out to him on Twitter as we see in the film. Um, and uh, a week later, Odessa, Christo and I were uh, sneaking across Europe essentially to go and meet with uh, uh, Navalny and uh, Maria in the Black Forest to convince them uh, to make a documentary and, and or rather to convince them to make a documentary with us. Um, and that's how I got involved in the project. And, and uh, I'm sure Maria has a different perspective uh, on that whole timeline. Um, can you say where was Navalny in his recovery process? At that, he was in the Black Forest. How far along was he in his recovery at that point when you made contact? I think Navalny had, had uh, Marie, you can correct me if, if I'm off on the timeline here, but I think it was about seven or eight weeks after Navalny had had woken up from his coma. Um, and he still looked a bit thin and a bit gaunt, but his his physiotherapy was, was well underway. Um, in the film, we see Navalny uh, with one of his personal trainers and he's working on his hand-eye coordination and he's juggling. I think we shot that sequence on the second or third day, which would have been November uh, 2020. Um, and so I think that gives insight into where he was at. Uh, he was well along, uh, he was well enough along on his recovery that he was already able to complete five or six rotations juggling uh, tennis balls. Um, mm -hmm. This is something I cannot do uh, right even now. So he was, he was in pretty good shape, but it was still clear that there was a uh, uh, lingering uh, residual damage uh, from this his attempted murder. So was the first main, outside of that juggling scene, were the first main things that you shot the, the interview in the bar where he's facing directly to camera? Actually, that interview was one of the last things we shot. We wow. had a very compressed timeline to shoot this film. We met Alexei and Maria on, I think, November 12, 13, or 14. 2020, so at the end of 2020. Um, and we understood at the beginning that Navalny would be going back at some point in the near future. We didn't know if it would be in 2020 or early 2021, but it was made clear and we understood that we had a very compressed timeline with the subject of this film. Um, and once we understood when he would be going back on January 17th, 2021, uh, it became clear that one of the last things we had to shoot was this interview. 
And by that point, by the time we shot the interview, I think that there was a, a great deal of trust built uh, between the film team and Navalny's team, or at the very least between the film team and Navalny himself. Um, and he was a very good sport sitting for that interview. It was lengthy and it was long. We had shot for, I think, 13 hours over the course of two or three days. And it's only in retrospect that I appreciate the historic nature of that interview. It's the last interview he gave. Uh, one of his last acts as a, as a free man. Um, and I think that that just speaks to the significance and importance uh, of the interview in and of itself. Mm -hmm. so, um, so when, Maria, I'd love to hear from you on kind of from your perspective, the beginning of the project. What was the idea when this started? Like, what, was it just, was it the film that you ended up with or, or were you initially setting out to make something more uh, I don't know, more, more just interviews or what was the goal at the beginning of the project that attracted you to it? Well, we had a very personal goal. Um, I, <clears throat> I, I came up with the idea that, you know, a movie like that would be interesting while, while Navalny was still in coma. And I was just, you know, we were visiting him every now and then. And, uh, you know, it's not really fun to visit a comatose um person like you don't really get to hang out properly and you just you know you just sit there and wait for god knows what and obviously I was very um upset about what happened um and this um chemical weapons poisoning you know that's not something that happens to you every day is it um so kind of intuitively I even back in Siberia when it all happened um I just started to like film everything with my phone um, I, I wasn't sure why um, I wasn't sure what I'm going to do with it mm -hmm. and to be honest in this first you see if you, quite a lot of, of that footage um, in the beginning of the film and um, when we're having arguments with the hospital staff with the police there and all of that yeah. um, so obviously back then it seems you know we didn't even know whether Navalny would survive whether he would make it we didn't know whether he would be allowed out of Russia or anything like that so Essentially, me and my colleagues just kind of kept our phones out just in case. Um, and um, while Alexei was recovering, recovering in Germany, I was thinking, you know, of ways of revenge. And um, of, and I think that it's this idea of filming how we are investigating who poisoned him. It's it, like it's it, it's on the surface. Mm -hmm. um and um i was absolutely sure that we would be able to figure out who did it well to be fair i was absolutely sure that putin was at his assassination uh and they, they the, the the question was just whether we would be able to arrive and prove to arrive to the same conclusion you know using some sort of data and documents and things like that so we started to investigate straight away and um as soon as uh, alexei was out of coma and he was reasonably well uh, I just said, okay, right, like that's that's the film. We should we should film how we are investigating your poisoning, and we'll agree that it was a great idea. And it stayed like that. That you know, little amateur video kind of shot in an iPhone for a while. And we have spoken to many um, directors who um, offered us to kind of you know do their own version of this film, but it never really we never really clicked. Until well, until that November meeting with um, Christo Daniel and Odessa Ray, the producer, um, when we realized that okay, well, this this guys looks look like the guys who will be actually able to pick up whatever we had at this point of time and continue to film uh, professionally. That that's that cell phone footage is amazing. Uh... I mean, first of all, it looks very good for cell phone footage. I mean, it looks handheld and everything, but it's the the, the images are are really compelling. But more than that, it's the access. I mean, the fact that you're there, like that scene in the hospital when the, yeah. the guards are, have the note, they're masked down below their noses in the hallway. That whole sequence is amazing. Mm -hmm. And also, was this also cell phone footage when yeah, yeah. when okay. Navalny goes back to Russia? there's footage of him right there at customs, right? When they're finally arresting him. It, it, it's kind of incredible that you have cameras right there at that moment. Was that cell phone or Daniel, were you there at that point? 
Yeah, that's something I, I can speak to. Um, you know, that was a, a unique moment in, in nonfiction filmmaking where we, we understood that something big was happening. There was this big event that, and, and uniquely we had the opportunity to get coverage from, you know, uh, 360 degrees of, of what was happening. Um, and so that night for that shoot, we had four units. We had a unit with Christo in Vienna. We had a unit with shooting Maria and Leonid, Navalny's chief of staff in Berlin. I was on the ground in Berlin. And we had to find two cinematographers in Berlin with Russian passports who were brave enough to do this mission and go on that flight because we had no idea what would happen. So we found these two guys who were uh, Russians living in Berlin who happened to be cinematographers, like the two in existence. Um, and I briefed them for 20 minutes. I told them exactly what the, the plan was. And I, I asked the guys how frightened they were. And the first guy was like, I'm a six out of 10. And the other guy was like, I'm a, you know, I'm a three out of 10. And so I said, three out of 10, you're sitting in the front and six out of 10, you're sitting in the back. And my directive to them was if door to door, gate to gate, you're on that plane for four hours, I want you to bring me three hours and 55 minutes of footage. I want to get every announcement from the pilot. Just shoot everything. Well, Maria, I have a, a question for you. Uh, I mean, it's picking up on what Daniel was just saying, but to me, one of the most remarkable things about the film is how it combines this intimate, up-close access to Navalny and his family and, and the people in his life with the scale of, right, this is an internationally significant historic story. And there's a sense of the, the great importance of this moment, but also the intimacy of his, you're, you're with this man seeing up front what's going, playing on his face. Hopefully he'll log back in. Um, was that always the, the approach with this film to kind of combine the, the intimate and the, you know, larger story? Well, that's, I mean, that's definitely a question to Daniel because he, he, he is the filmmaker there. I'm, yeah. you know, in, in this specific situation, I'm more of a subject really rather than, um, rather than the filmmaker. So like I didn't, we didn't really um, plan those things, you know, like um, you kind of with this film is you, you, you get what it actually was. Like there wasn't my, there, there wasn't any staging or preparation or, you know, decision making around, you know, what and where to film and how and and all of that. It's um, well, I've been through this through these days personally. I was then, and I've seen the film as well. It's pretty close to how it actually was. Like that, that that's that's very representative, and it feels like that. That's exactly how that day, for example, the departure date from Berlin to, to Moscow. That's exactly how it felt. Like just loads of you know, running up and down one corridor, like packing things, getting suitcases ready and saying goodbyes and, you know, making yeah. final plans and arrangements. Yeah. Um, so um, I think that uh, we got to, it, it, it's, it was very generous from uh, Navalny and his family to allow um, this unprecedented level of access. I was personally surprised um, to, um, about how, you know how patient they were, and uh, how much how how much time they agreed to to spend with the film making team. Because I mean, there is a huge difference between being filmed on a, a phone by your friend uh, and being filmed by a, you know a, a large film team with I don't right. know a sound sound guy like a light guy or this guy etc. But they were very keen. Uh, the Navalny's they were very keen to participate. And I think like this is what made this movie so great without his sincere desire to make this movie outstanding. I don't think it would be possible. I could never have anticipated Navalny to like spend, I think it was about 15 or 18 hours actually just sitting still answering every question. Um, there is this moment in the film where I'm asking him whether he, well, when I think that the camera is off and I'm asking him whether he's comfortable enough, whether he, whether he wants this to stop or like this, I don't know, silly questions about his childhood to, to, to go away. And he says, and he says, no. So he was so open to this idea. And, and we, and we all were just on, on board. We decided uh, there was, there was not a single 
there wasn't another documentary that was made about this time in um, in our lives. We weren't giving interviews. We weren't um, participating like in, in in talk shows or anything like that. So whatever exclusive um, material that we had, we have given it to this film, and I hope that it's paid off. Uh, absolutely. Well, welcome back, Daniel. Well, I'm, we'll I'm, just, I'm to, of course, Josh, my internet decided to cut out in the, in the middle of, of the conversation, so I apologize for that, but I hope that I'm coming through loud and clear right now. Uh, and I just want to add a point to what Maria just spoke to, and that's the question of access, and more specifically, Navalny as subject and the genius of Navalny as subject. This is sort of a dream come true situation for a documentarian. And we think of, when, when I think of why Navalny was so keen to participate in this film and give us his time and, and attention, I think he, his great genius is his mastery of media and his mastery of social media. And he viewed us, the filmmaking team, and the entire process um, as something to weaponize. And I, and I mean that in, in the most strategic way for both a politician and a political dissident. I think what Navalny understood was that he was going to go back to Russia. There was a high probability he would get arrested and he needed some kind of vehicle to keep his name in the global consciousness. And I think one of the things that we offered him was such a vehicle, uh, a film like this of, this, of the caliber that I was anticipating and pitching and, and aspiring to create uh, would be something that could galvanize attention for him and his plight when he is languishing in a gulag somewhere. Um, and it's because of his vision and his trust and his commitment to that project and that conceit uh, that we are here now. Um, and he is, that's why he is the most extraordinary subject. And I think that that, that, that just enriches the film um, wholly, fully. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's astonishing. I, when you cut out, I was saying to Maria that the film, one of the most powerful aspects of the film to me is how it combines the, that in it, its access, but it's also intimacy of seeing him like thoughts playing out on his face, the way he interacts with his, his colleagues and his family. You're like right there. I mean, this intimate sense of the man, but it's coupled obviously with the historical scope of, of the significance of this moment, you know, internationally, what he signifies. And one thing that I might just add to that, Josh, is I remember when we shot that scene that we were just speaking about before I cut out, um, when Alexei and Yulia were leaving from in the morning in the hotel room. Um, and, and it was the most pressure-filled, anxiety-induced morning of my life. Like this weight hung in the air. It was as if everybody was like sitting shiva. It just felt heavy and intense. And... And that was the first time Alexei actually yelled at me. I, I came to his room too early and, and he was so stressed that he just started screaming and I just sort of disappeared from the doorway and sat in the hall. And there's a moment in the film where, where we have Alexei apologizing to me. He says, Daniel, I'm so sorry. I just told you to get the fuck out of here with your camera. Um, and that really speaks to like the intensity of that morning. Up until that point, he had no problem yelling at his staff and being like a, a commanding boss, but the film team occupied a different space for him. Uh, and the, the stress of that morning was just super intense. And I think the, that moment in the film really captures what it felt to be there. Mm -hmm. I, I Related to that, I, I wanted to talk about the, I don't know, the, the style of the film, the, the genre that you've created here. I mean, obviously this is a, a very serious documentary but the way it's edited, the pacing, uh, so many of the artistic choices, this is a totally engrossing thriller, right? I, this feels like watching All the President's Men or a, a political thriller like that, where you, like I am leaning in to watch this film, like what is gonna happen? The stakes could not be higher, but the way you're telling it, I don't, it, it, it totally, right? This is not a dry detached talking heads documentary. This is, you are living through it and the way it's paced and edited feels like a thriller, not in a way that trivializes the story, but makes it very engaging to viewers. And I'm wondering, when did you, when did that come about for you as a filmmaker? Were you thinking of like in those terms from the beginning or did that come when you saw the footage that you had and how to working with your editors? I think that we had a, a sense from the very beginning that this was a thriller. This was a murder mystery. It started off as a murder mystery more, more than a thriller, like a whodunit. Mm -hmm. but we obviously know who, 
who did it. It's just, how did they do it? And so we started following the murder investigation, but I just like, you know, I had these points of references. Like when I was thinking about the movie, I was thinking about it in, in, uh, you know, in, in very cinematic terms, I wanted it to feel exactly as you are describing it, this edge of your seat thriller. Um, and that's how we shot it. I wanted to, to, to shoot it very cinematically with a soft depth of field. If a cinematographer had time to set up a scene, um, how would that individual set that scene up? And Nikki Waddle, who is the director of photography on this film, those were very much the early conversations we were having. And he did a very, very simple lighting setup in one of the main spaces where we were shooting. Um, and it was just this big Chimera sort of balloon that he just hung from the ceiling essentially. Uh, that could just sit there and it could just, it just covered everything. But what it did was it just made the space bright, but also had this sort of simmering moodiness to it. Mm -hmm. um, and we just left it there. We turned it on and we left it there. And when we see the phone call scene, for example, uh, it, it looks like, you know, a, a cinematographer was able to, to do setups and light it and bring the camera over here and get coverage and go click off his shot list. Um, but we were just, you know, very much doing a verite shooting from the hip style of documentary, but we tried to elevate it. Um, and, you know, this question of make it a thriller uh, is, is like, uh, we wanted to play with genre in a way. The film opens with Navalny directing me. Here we have the subject of the film telling the filmmaker how the film's going to be. And that was really important to us because A, my instinct was to, to make it this propulsive, thrilling film. Um, but I thought it was so interesting if we added layers to this, the onion that is this movie about sort of like the meta quality of this social media genius, this politician whose greatest strength perhaps is mastery of media, using me as a tool to further his political goals in a way. Um, and the entire editorial staff, um, Langdon Page and Maya Daisy Hawk, who are two of the finest documentary editors on the planet, um, you know, they they were the ones I think who really shook out that 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 meta quality of like who's directing who here. What is it to make a film about a politician, um, and how can we bring some of that fabric into the movie? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm I'm really glad that they had that genius because it I think it makes the film way more interesting for viewers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to, there's one scene in particular or sequence I want to ask you about. It's, it's, uh, I keep thinking about it. Uh, it's the scene right in the middle of the film where they are making the phone calls to the team that they think poisoned him and the way that they trick those people on the phone. Well, the first two, you know, hang up pretty quickly, but the third guy kind of reveals everything. And Navalny is taking such delight in that. I mean, there's this sense of excitement and also how much he's enjoying the process. I, I felt like I got so much of his, obviously I've never met Navalny outside of this film, but I, in, the, in that moment especially, I felt like I got such insight into who he was as a person, like his strength and in, in incredible intelligence and of the team in the room working with him, but also how much he enjoyed it. And like, he's a consummate actor, right? He's, he is performing in that role to trick this guy into giving all the information. And I just, I would love to hear about sort of how you approach that as filmmakers, um, right? You presumably, you didn't know what was gonna happen. You, you were there to capture it in real time, but can you talk about filming that sequence? Well, that's precisely right. And I think it, it speaks to a very important part of the movie, which I spoke to a moment ago, which is this thing of like, making a film about someone who benefits from you making the film about them and is somehow weaponizing the filmmaking process for their own political gain and understanding that Navalny is very much a performer and he loves to perform. He loves to make his YouTube videos and he loves to look at, be on camera and he's fabulous at it. Um, I think if he were here, he might say, oh, I don't love to do that, but it's just part of my job. I have to. But my read is that he actually does enjoy it. And Alexei, from, from what I could tell my time with him, although limited, uh, was that he's someone who really enjoys media and learning about technology and the internet. And, and if he weren't in, in prison right now, he would be really interested in learning about NFTs and, and AI. And, and, and he'd be thinking about how can we take these utilities and these new types of media and further our political agenda. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so when we were shooting that specific sequence, the conceit was that it was a prank. We see in the scene, he shifts tactics. He goes from, hi, this is Navalny. Why did you try and poison me? Of course, that didn't work. Everybody hung up um, to taking a more serious approach. And it must be said that Navalny's performance playing that role was astonishingly effective. It would be as if you call up someone in the American military, for example, and you have to have the specific jargon and tone to yeah. trick that individual. Um, Alexei grew up in a military town. His father was a military man. Um, and so he had this jargon and this lexicon that, that would make, that would sell it, that would make it believable. And from my perspective, shooting it, we had been filming for about two hours and, and I had very little expectation that this whole scheme would work out to begin with. Um, and I was sitting back, I, I had my coverage, I was just paying, you know, paying attention. And, and then at one moment I sort of understood, I clocked, even though I don't speak a word of Russian, that um, one of these phone calls was going longer than the others had been. And then out of the corner of my eye, I noticed that Maria, Maria's jaw unhinged and hit the floor. And that's when a, a shot uh, of electricity ran through my spine and I stiffened up and I realized that something was happening here. And I just checked the battery. I made sure we had enough space on our hard drives and I just kept, kept shooting and kept held her steady and made sure we were in focus and make sure all systems were go. Um, and then at one point, because I, I was filming and I'm, I'm always afraid that if my clips, if I'm actually filming runs too long, if that file is corrupted, you lose the whole file. So every three minutes I was double tapping, which is a risky maneuver when you're filming, but I was just afraid of, of somehow corrupting or losing the content. So we just kept filming. And what that scene feels like in the movie was what it felt like shooting it, even though I don't speak a word of Russian and neither did Nikki Waddle, uh, the director of photography of the movie. Maria, can you talk about your experience in that scene? And did you think when that started, did you have any expectations of what you were going to get those guys to say on the phone? Did it seem like a crazy <clears throat> scheme or did you think we're actually going to get them? No, we absolutely not. Like, honestly, it was uh, among my expectations were below zero. Imagine it was like um, it was 4 a.m. I think when we all gathered in that house to make those calls. The like, night before that, I was working um, on an investigation on, in, in parallel. We were making an investigation about Putin's palace. Um, so like, and it's, it's a big, big, <clears throat> big chunk of work. So I was like, I know, up until 2 a.m. Then had a like, small nap, mm -hmm. um, waking up and thinking like, oh, we have to, have to like, drive and go and make those calls. And they will be useless because we make them all the time and they are useless most of the times, to be fair. We will <clears throat> we always try to like call up uh, whoever we are investigating, and my colleagues who were sharing a house with me, <clears throat> um, uh, I tried to wake them up and say like, oh, let's go, let's go, let's go with me. It's going to be fun, and they were just like, no, Maria, absolutely no way. We're not going. We're sleeping. Uh, just wake us up when you're back. And, and and I remember that I said I needed to drive like for half an hour or something. So I drove, picked up Alexei from his house. Drove, we drove to the to this house where we shot the phone call. And yeah, I mean to be honest, I just wanted this to be over. Like I wanted to sleep and have a, I don't know a little bit of rest or something. And then the first couple of calls, obviously not all of the calls made it to the film. And um, first couple of calls, maybe five, six, seven, were completely useless, like nothing really came out of them um and um and then this draft call, call happened it was maybe seven or eight call in the row maybe even nine or something like that and um when he um started talking because first the conversation was pretty bleak it was like he, he said that he had covid and you know it wasn't really clear whether he is going to say anything whether he's going to bite you know um, and uh then I think Alexei asked him whether he was in Omsk and whether he traveled to Omsk or something like that. And then the guy, the FSB guy says, he does like, mm hmm And this is when we all suddenly woke up. You know, we're just like, oh, he confirmed he was in Omsk. You know, that was enough for us. That was enough. We would be happily, you know, would be, we would happily wrap it up and say, look, we confirmed that this guy who we found, he, he was on that day in Omsk, all adds up perfect. 
And then he just starts talking and talking and talking and listening, just describing everything. The actual call, the length of the call is, I think, like 48 or 49 minutes. Uh, so you see like two or three minutes in the film. Incredible. Um, it, it's 49 minutes. Uh, we were extremely bored at the end of this meeting. Like I, I remember Christo walking out, you know, to get a coffee, me as well, you know, because we were just bored of the guy. Like we asked everything and he, he, he gave us every tiny detail, including like the color of Navalny's underwear because the, that guy was responsible for cleaning, cleaning it up and for removing traces of chemical weapons uh, from his clothes. And he gave us, he confessed that it was the police that gave him the um, bag with, with, with Navalny's belongings. He confessed, he, he gave, gave us every detail of his trip, who he traveled with, who asked him, who ordered him, who's like everything. He just said everything. And um, obviously for us, uh, it was, we discussed it with, with, with Christo straight away, like after the call finished. Um, we were just sitting there thinking this, this is the highlight of our careers as investigators. Like nothing remotely as cool can happen to, right. to, to us again, because like that, this is as good as it gets. Um, and I don't think that anything comparable to this ever happened to it, to any other investigator. Yeah. And well, so far it's been two years, nothing, um, nothing remotely as cool has happened to me, sadly, <laughs> uh, but I'm trying not to lose hope. <laughs> do you the one thing I do want to quickly mention, Josh, and Marie can speak to this. Um, last week, a few of Maria's colleagues um, called up the son of uh, Putin's press secretary, Dmitry Peskov. Yeah. And, and what did they do? They fooled him again, they, Maria. Yeah, and I mean, that's what we, we just told him that we are the, um, you know, the military people responsible for, 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 for signing people up with the army because there is mobilization and that he's being mobilized and he needs to show up in, in some military um, headquarters somewhere in Moscow. And uh, yeah, the son of Putin's press secretary started to behave really funnily. And he was saying, oh, do you know who I am? How do you know my surname? Uh, well, I'm not going to. There is There will be an exception for me or something like that. So yeah, I mean, it does occasionally work, this prank calls. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, like one in a hundred, you can get a decent result and a fun video out of it. But obviously this call to the poisoner, that's 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 not the same. That's like that's a live confession yeah. to the but to the person who you tried to kill. I mean, like this is so it doesn't get worse than that. I don't think it gets more embarrassing for the secret services, um, even like theoretically, like such a failure. And do you, I think this is alluded to at the end of the film? But is where is that man today? Does anyone? Yeah, well, we were pretty sure that he's dead um, up until um, maybe a month ago. Uh, because we managed to locate every other member of this team, um, but not him. So, the, you know, the other guys, some of them changed names, some of them moved, some of them got different jobs, but we couldn't find any trace of the guy that we spoke to. Uh, but then some other database was leaked recently, and it turned out that he was alive in, uh, 20, in late 2021 because he took a COVID test, and that was leaked. Amazing. Wow. So yeah, thank you. He must, he must be still alive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I didn't know that. That's I actually I think that's nice. I'm glad he's not dead. <laughs> well, at least uh, he wasn't in 2021. Who knows? Maybe he is now. They probably sent him to the front line. Maybe to I punish him for what he'd done. Um, I I have one more question or or, or subject, which is really to talk about um. The, you know, I know you had social impact producers on the, on the film, David and Nina Fialco, and I'm, I would love to hear about that, like how you've approached the film in terms of social impact, but also related to that, I mean, I, I read Naval, Navalny, like in the last two weeks, had an op-ed in the Washington Post. So it's a two-part question. It's like, if you could talk about after the film, what, what's your sort of social impact strategy? And then second, how, I'd love to hear anything about how I, I'm like, how did Navalny get that op-ed out? How, how is he able to communicate? Is is there some open communication where he's able to get things out? Or was that all done surreptitiously? Um, Maria, why don't I answer the first part of the question, then you can speak to the second. Uh, before we, we talk about the impact 
producers. Uh, I don't think I have acknowledged the actual producers of the film. Um, Diane Becker, Melanie Miller, Shane Boris, and Odessa Ray. Um, and I, I feel silly for not doing that off, off the top, but these are a, a team uh, of producers who were extraordinary in empowering every single aspect of this production. Um, uh, you know, and empowering me fully, uh, these, this lineup, it's like every day they wake up and they say, how can we empower Daniel and the, the, and Langdon and Maya and the filmmaking team and the creative team and being a young director and working with producers who were so empowering was revelatory and extraordinary. Um, and, and just a wonderful dream that I'm really grateful for. Uh, after the film was finished, um, and uh, the world responded really positively to it. Impact producers uh, came on board to help us finance impact events. Um, and I think those impact events are really just to um, uh, get the film seen by as many influential people as possible and as many everyday people as possible, both like political decision makers of parliaments, embassies, um, and uh, govern, govern, governments around the world who are now responsible for developing sanctions packages um, um, and, uh, and that's really important, I think, for, for Navalny's security. I think our, our thought is that the more people who know Navalny's story, the more famous he is in the global consciousness as, as one of the world's, if not the world's foremost political prisoner, the safer he will be. Um, in regards to his current situation and how he's able to communicate with the outside world, I'll let Maria speak to that. Um, yeah, that Washington Post um, op-ed was was actually, it was written a while ago, maybe a couple of weeks, um, and that was when Alexei could handwrite letters and just send them out, um, so there is like no, no magic to that, you can do that uh, from prison, I mean they're being censored, but you can still do that, uh, but the situation has changed since, um, they have decided to like harshen up the conditions that Navalny is, is being kept in quite a lot in the past four to six weeks and he has been moved to like a solitary confinement like a punishment cell where he's on his own and um it's a t tiny little room two by three meters um concrete walls um a little tiny <clears throat> very narrow window close to the ceiling um at just a bed a chair and a and, and a little table and you're not even allowed to you cannot even lay down on the bed during the day or you cannot really use it because it's being chained up to, to, to the wall every morning and it's only being chained down like at bedtime. So um, that's Navalny's life now. And now he's only allowed to use pen and paper for 35 minutes a day. So obviously you cannot really write an op-ed in, in English or even in Russian during, um, that's that's not enough time. So um, this sort of op-ed won't, I'm not sure how whether they will be possible um from from now up uh, from now on so i think from around maybe early september um probably coinciding with things going really badly for for putin and for putin's army in ukraine they have decided to silence him completely as well he was silenced to a great extent before i mean it, it's not like an american yeah. prison you cannot like you couldn't call him or was he wasn't allowed to he was only allowed to see his family like once in three months or something like that he wasn't allowed any visitors and so he was isolated uh to a huge extent before but now they have decided to just shut everything down completely and even in the room where he's meeting with his lawyers um there used to be like a glass a plastic glass between them and they would talk through this glass uh, and now they have applied uh, like a non-transparent film to this to this window. So now the lawyers can only see Navalny's silhouette when 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 they go to see him and hear his voice. So that's that's all we get from him now. Is this is probably a, a very dumb question, but is there any uh, campaign in Russia? Are there any legal proceedings to get him out, even if they're doomed? Is it are there are people attempting within the legal system to change his sentence or anything like that or it's, it's, it's not possible to do it within the legal system his right. his his sentence is entirely and completely illegal it has been reverted by the european court of human rights 
we we have done every step possible and Russia just ignores the decision of the European Court of Human Rights. So there is absolutely nothing that can be done in legal um, in, in the legal space just because the, the sentence at the very first place is completely right. and entirely made up. And how, how many years is his term right now? I think now it's like nine and a half but he's about to get another sentence, which would be probably around 15 more years. Oh my God. Well, there, there is that footage, the very final footage of the film, I believe, is of him looking through the bars with the, his shaved head, obviously mm -hmm. looking very different. Was that video captured back closer to production or is that more recent no. footage? That, that was very close to production. That was like within two weeks from his imprisonment, I think. Now he looks very different. Now he uh, he lost a lot of weight. Uh, he's very very skinny now, uh, because they are um, well, quite 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 frankly speaking, they are being underfed. They don't have enough food in prison. So for a man, uh, for especially for like a tall man um, who is used to I don't know taking three meals a day, um, this is a bit of a torture because they literally they, the portions are tiny. And uh, he's just malnutritioned and um, constantly hungry. Um, this is why he has lost a lot of weight, and he looks he looks now exactly like he looked after he woke up from like wow. twenty days of coma. Wow. Well, um, thank you for talking with Film Independent. I, I just, again, I just want to say I, the film is so powerful, so well made and, and so important. And um, uh, I hope everybody watches this film. If you're by chance seeing this Q&A and haven't seen the film, please go watch it. Um, and uh, Daniel and Maria, thank you so much for taking time to talk with us today. Josh, thank the pleasure. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you.